want to feel uncomfortable for whatever reason, stick around, grab your spaghetti, warm up your grimy tub water, and keep your cats indoors. Today we're talking about Gumo. So before we dive into this one, trigger warning for animal cruelty at the very least. This is not for sensitive viewers. So I'm Mike, I'm a therapist, and if you haven't seen this video first, introducing what I'm doing here, then you might want to go and see it just so you know what's going on. I'm playing a little game of re-watching movies. I'm first describing what I remember from the movie. Memory's not that great, not very detail-oriented kind of. So I'm sharing what I remember from my first watch, and then giving an updated review for poops and giggles. So here's my impression from my first watch that I can remember. This one makes you feel odd and sad and weird. You would think I would have more descriptive words for emotions as a therapist, but here we are. Not horror per se, but quite unsettling, and I lump it in with other disturbing horror movies, honestly. So my initial recollection is, so this is a bleak look at a small community after a natural disaster, which I think was a tornado. It has a found footage vibe sometimes, but not always. So there are multiple characters and stories. Some seem to make sense and follow a sequence and the others don't. Some black metal music going on, which is interesting for a movie. And of course, the animal cruelty in the form of two turd boys uh, catching and hunting local cats to sell to a supplier who provides meat for a local restaurant. We are not going to dive into that one. So I remember there's this young girl who ends up having breast cancer. There's some shirtless, seemingly intoxicated dudes fighting each other, I think. None of it seems to be in any particular order from what I remember. So the biggest part that I recall is the bathtub scene. Kid who's been present throughout the movie is just like hanging out in his bathtub and the water is filthy. While he's hanging out in the bathtub, he's just like eating spaghetti, you know, normal bathtub food. And he's like swimming around and playing and stuff and it just sticks with you because it's like ooh, what so there's a bunny kid so a kid that a boy that is walking around with like bunny ears on looks like louise from uh, bob's burgers he has an accordion which he at one point plays quite aggressively mini side note shortly after watching this for the first time my daughter came home from her grandparents house with a tiny little baby accordion she was playing it aggressively outside of the door, walking up to the front door, and I was like, what is going on? So I think that this movie is supposed to make you feel weird and unsettled. I think that's completely what they were going for. And I still think about it a lot. Like way more than anyone probably should. Alright, so second watch. Everything I said before that I wrote down prior to watching it. I didn't edit it in any shape or form. So this is what happened after I rewatched it. So I didn't remember the explanation about the tornado in the beginning that the boy gives. It's pretty brutal. Describing what happens with the tornado and how a lot of the fathers and parents died in the midst of the destruction. This town is in Ohio when I like looked up some stuff after the rewatch I found out that this was actually filmed in Nashville Tennessee if you know like the United States geography you know that Ohio is above Kentucky and Tennessee is below Kentucky and I live in Kentucky this movie hits in weird ways because I did community-based mental health services for years and it's a fairly accurate portrayal of places that are just kind of desolate and have been left in ruins. For some, for my work definitely primed me for some of the, the unsettling environmental features of this movie. The bugs, the trash, the chaos. I'm just glad that it's absent of the smell part. Follow several different sets of characters, just like I said in the beginning, but this time it made more sense and I realized it was less disjointed than I thought. It follows several characters with the primary ones being two boys, Solomon and Tumblr. And there's three sisters, there's Money Boy, there's several other random characters that are just kind of sprinkled in. Boys engage in a lot of antisocial behavior, so they definitely fall into a range of like, hmm, these kiddos might have conduct disorder. So like I stated in the beginning, they do catch cats to sell. They find out they have some competition from the guy who's buying the cats from them. 
they confront their competition, which is another little boy trying to make ends meet. They learn that this kid is caring for his grandma, who is comatose and cannot function independently and is kept alive by machines. Boys decide that they're going to break into that house to gather information and they end up turning the machine off on grandma. So there's your murder. The boys justify it by saying that she's already dead. She's been dead for a while. So I think that the kids and characters in this movie have seen so much violence and just chaos that they're very desensitized to it. I think that that's a big variable in some of the behavior of the boys. This movie has some of the strangest scenes that don't make any sense to me. The interactions that Solomon has with his mom where he is like lifting weights, but they're like for real, like just eating utensils that have been taped together. And he's like lifting the weights and then his mom is tap dancing in his father's shoes around him and begging for him to smile. Uh, there's a point where there's some adult twin men washing each other in the bathtub. That's just a transition scene. And then there's a scene where I recall it being like just some dudes fighting. Well, in reality, it was a bunch of adults, um, Tumwar, the older boy, and it seems like they're all intoxicated, they're all drinking, and one individual loses a game of their, their arm wrestling, and one individual loses the arm wrestling to a little person who is present in the movie, and uh, he decides to just like flip the table over and breaks off the legs and is just like losing his cool, and then at some point there's a chair wrestling scene. So no cats were really harmed in this movie, but I can't say the same thing for the chair. So the, the loose thread that's kind of tying all this together besides it being in the same town is this little black cat that the girls own that is spared in the beginning of the movie because they realize the girls own it and that's someone's pet. So they do have some kind of sense of right and wrong, I guess. Yeah, there's the dirty bathtub scene that I recall pretty much the same. I recall a lot of it, except for maybe like the soap that is flinging around the spaghetti. Mm, his candy bar that he gets and drops in the water and then proceeds to pull back out and eat it. So the black cat ends up being lost. They can't find it. It's not entirely clear what happens to the cat, but the cat is found deceased. I'm going to leave some of the details out of it because it's troubling. So the movie just kind of like ends with the confirmation that the cat is gone and Bunny Boy is uh, basically breaks the fourth wall by showing the dead cat to the audience. So I decided I'm going to look up some stuff about this because like I want to know for real like are some of these people real people? And they're just being themselves? Are they all actors? Like I had so many questions. This movie is considered an experimental drama film. It's supposed to have a really loose narrative and the writer and director decided that he wanted to abandon the three-act plot pattern that most stories follow and to look at something as more of like a collage, which I can appreciate. I like the confusion. So just in case you're super curious like I was, the writer decided to base this whole place on his hometown and uh, he talked a lot about how the people in the hometown were interesting to him. These people are interesting to me. I've never seen them represented on screen in a true way. And yeah, I feel like this movie kind of kind of does that. He said that most of the actors were not were not local, that most of them were his friends, and described uh, the kiddo that plays Solomon as looking like no other kid in the world, which is fair. He is an interesting looking kiddo. So the writer-director decided to cast people based on their visual aura. In summary, I naively thought that I would be able to watch this movie and it would be fine and dandy. No big deal. I've seen it before. But in the end, it ended up being kind of like smashing every bleak, hopeless, sad feeling that I've like ever had with a client ever. It was all in a really small time frame. That evening the movie kept playing in my head and I had some trouble falling asleep, but I think there were some other variables there. One reason is that it is incredibly realistic. The found footage thing, it's like, okay, did somebody really just like walk around with a camera and film some people in the country? 
Also, there was a lot of storms going on where I live when this was happening. So I think that that played into the whole, like, not sleeping, feeling unsettled. I spent two days without Wi-Fi during the course of that. Not a good time. Skipped over a lot of little bits and pieces, so you'll definitely have to check it out yourself if you're interested in it. I want to point out where the movie was praised for having bacon taped to the wall during the bathtub scene. I could not find a reason why. If someone can explain that to me and why that is worth praise, I would appreciate it. If not, I guess it's just best left to the unknown. Stay tuned, I'm going to do more reviews on movies that I have watched previously and it's been long enough that I can't remember most of them, so rewatch will be completely different. Check back in and I'll see you again soon.